I'm Eddie Chumney, Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. In this teaching, we're going to be sharing with you on the subject of the Melchizedek Priesthood. So what is the Melchizedek Priesthood? The Melchizedek Priesthood is a part of the government of God. The God of Israel has a kingdom, and God the Father is the king of his kingdom. And the Father has an agent who administers the duties of his kingdom, and that is the job task of Yeshua the Son. And so the father is the king of his kingdom, but he has a government that rules and reigns with him. And Yeshua is the head of that government. And as being the head of that government, Yeshua also himself is a king and he's the king of kings. And the Melchizedek priesthood is his title in his role as being a king, a priest, and a firstborn of heaven's kingdom. And so when we have a kingdom, what are the component parts that will make up the kingdom of the God of Israel. So we need a king, but then we have a need a way to run that kingdom. We need a constitution. And so what is the constitution of the kingdom of the God of Israel? He runs his kingdom according to his Torah. So the father is the king of his kingdom, and he runs his kingdom according to his Torah. And he gives the administration to run that kingdom over to Yeshua, who is the son of the father. And Yeshua has the title of being the king over his father's kingdom. He's also the high priest over his father's kingdom. And he is in the position of firstborn over his father's kingdom as well. So in order to have a kingdom, you need a king. You need a government. The structure is the Melchizedek priesthood. You need a rule of law. That's the Torah. And you need a place in order to rule. And so the place where the God of Israel rules is in his universe that he created. He's the king of the universe. And the Bible says that the earth is his footstool. And his domain is the universe that he creates And he rules over. And then he also needs a people through whom he's going to govern. And the name of this people is the nation of Israel. And so this is how the kingdom of God is structured. And this teaching is going to give you a detailed explanation regarding how his government operates. And so the authority element of his government is called the Melchizedek priesthood. And the first thing we're going to share with you is that Yeshua is the father's agent who administers his kingdom and he's over his the universe of his father and he's over the earth as well and so we're going to see that yeshua has the office of king priest and firstborn 
which are the offices associated with the Melchizedek priesthood. So, in the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 3, page 238, it explains the father. It explains the following. I will make King Messiah a firstborn, as it says. And then there's a quote from Psalm 89 and verse 27. If you're looking at a King James Bible in a Jewish published Bible, it's Psalm chapter 89 and verse 28, which reads, and I will appoint him firstborn. In the Midrash Rabbah, Exodus 19, 7, we also have the quotation teaching that King Messiah will be a firstborn. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. Rabbi Nathan said, The Holy One, blessed be he, told Moses, Just as I have made Jacob a firstborn, for it says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. So will I make King Messiah a firstborn, as it says. And then this is quoting from Psalm 89, verse 28 in a Jewish published Bible. And I will appoint him firstborn. And the King James It's Psalm 89, verse 27. We can see that in Yeshua's birth in this world, that he was the firstborn son of his parents. Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. And she, that is Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Yeshua is the firstborn of many brethren. And this is a reference to his office uh, and his role of being the firstborn in the kingdom of his father. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, Yeshua is a firstborn, but there are many firstborns in the kingdom of God. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, it is said of Yeshua that he's the image of the invisible God. Yeshua is the firstborn of every creature. And firstborn is a title of an office. It's a place of position in God the Father's kingdom. Now, Yeshua is not only heaven's firstborn, but he is also heaven's high priest. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, it is written, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Messiah Yeshua. We are told the same in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed in the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we yet without sin. So Yeshua is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek or after the order of the Melchizedek priesthood. In Psalm chapter 110 and verse 4, it is written, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You, referring to King Messiah, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, regarding Yeshua and Psalm 110 verse 4, that is quoted in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 17. For he testifies regarding Yeshua that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And 
We are told the same in Hebrews in chapter 6 and verse 20. Whether the forerunner is with us entered, even Yeshua made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's explained in the Midrash Rabbat to Numbers 6, 2, that the firstborn also has kingship rights. Take the sum of Numbers chapter 4, verse 22. But with kings upon the throne, Job chapter 36, verse 7, signifies that the Holy One, blessed be he, allotted honor to the firstborn. And by them, kingship should fittingly be assumed, as it says, but the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Second Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 3. In the case of David, it likewise says, and I will appoint him firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Psalm chapter 89 and verse 27. So Psalm 89 verse 27 is literally referring to King David, but prophetically referring to King Messiah, even Yeshua HaMashiach. So now we can see that a king of Israel can also be a firstborn. Yeshua is the king of Israel. In John chapter 1, verse 47 and verse 49, it is written, Yeshua saw Nathanael coming to him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. We can see that Yeshua is not only the king of Israel, but he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19 verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Yeshua is the word of God. John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So Yeshua is the word of God. And what does it say about Yeshua, the word of God in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Yeshua is not just any Melchizedek priest. He is the supreme Melchizedek priest. And he is unique among all Melchizedek priests in the governmental structure of the kingdom of the God of Israel. In Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 8, it is written, But under the sun, he said, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. To the sun, it was said, Your throne, O God. So, Yeshua, he is Yahweh. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so Yeshua rules over his father's kingdom as a king, as a high priest, and he governs that kingdom in justice and in righteousness because he rules with a righteous scepter. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 is quoting from Psalm chapter 45 and verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a right scepter. Yeshua is the redeemer of Israel. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So let's summarize what we've covered so far in the beginning of this teaching. We are explaining to you the Melchizedek priesthood and the government of the kingdom of God. And so... In the government of the kingdom of God, 
we have God the Father as being the supreme authority. And who runs his kingdom is Yeshua. And so Yeshua is the highest ranking authority among those who's ruling and reigning over the kingdom of the heavenly father. So Yeshua is a Melchizedek priest. And what we're going to see, given that he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords, that in the Melchizedek priesthood, it consists of the offices of king, priest, and firstborn. So Yeshua is the supreme king, priest, and firstborn in the kingdom of the heavenly father. But there are those that are ruling and reigning with Yeshua. They also are Melchizedek priests, and they also have the office of king, priest, and firstborn. So in looking at Yeshua and who he is, we saw scripturally that Yeshua is heaven's firstborn. And the firstborn has priestly duties and kingship rights. Yeshua is high priest of his father's kingdom. And he is also the king of kings of his father's kingdom. And what we are going to see is the responsibilities of being a king, priest, firstborn in the kingdom of the God of Israel, to be a part of his government. One who has the position of firstborn high priest and king is able to rule and reign in the kingdom of God over others. And one of his duties in this office is to be a kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer in Hebrew is Goel. And what we're going to see is Yeshua gets tested and he's found faithful to be a faithful son over his father's kingdom. We see this in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. So in the kingdom of the heavenly Father, there's different classes of entities. And one of the classes is the angelic class. And Yeshua is not in that angelic class. And so in Psalm in chapter 2 and verse 6, it is written, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So Yeshua is regarded as being a faithful son over his father's kingdom. And he sits on a throne and that throne is in the heavenly Jerusalem, which is called Mount Zion. As we can see in Psalm chapter two and verse six, that Yeshua's throne is in the new Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Psalm chapter 48 and verse 2. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And so Mount Zion is the city where the king's throne and where he rules and reigns from. And who rules and reigns there is the son. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, you are my son. This day have I begotten thee. So Yeshua is a faithful son. He's a king and he's a faithful son to administer the kingdom of his father. Hebrews chapter one, verse five, it is written unto Which of the angels said he at any time, I will be to him a father 
and he shall be to me a son. This is a quote from Psalm 89, verse 26. He will cry unto me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So when you are faithful to do the duty and task of the heavenly father, you have the the name and the title of being his son. So being the son of God refers to be being faithful to the father in your tasks and your responsibilities within the kingdom of God. And so we can see that Yeshua is a faithful son to his father over his own house or over his own people that's been given to him of the father. And what's the name of that people? It's the house of Jacob. It's the nation of Israel. Hebrews in chapter three, verses one and two, and then verses five and six, it is written. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the high priest of our profession, Messiah Yeshua, who is faithful to him that appointed him, who appointed him, the father. Also, as Moses was faithful in all his house and Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. So Moses was given a task to do. He was given the task to go to Pharaoh and to tell the elders of Israel that the God of Israel was going to redeem his people. And Moses was to be a shepherd and a leader of the people in being an agent that the God of Israel was going to use in this redemption. And as being an agent, Moses had the, the place and the position of being a servant of God. But we're told in Hebrews in chapter 3, verse 6, but Messiah as a son over his own house. And so who's over the house of Jacob? That is Yeshua. And so we can see this in Luke in chapter 1 in verses 32 and 33, as it is written, and he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he, that is Yeshua, shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And so Yeshua is to rule over the people of the heavenly father in his kingdom. The name of the people of the kingdom of the heavenly father is the nation of Israel or the house of Jacob. And the heavenly father has appointed Yeshua to be over that house, to be faithful over that house, to be the king over that house, to be the high priest over that house, to be a faithful firstborn over that house. And so in his faithfulness, he's called the son of his father. In John chapter 9, in verses 35 through 37, it is written, Yeshua heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said, do you believe on the son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Yeshua said to him, you have both seen him and it is he that talks with you. Yeshua is the son of God. John chapter 20, verse 31, it is written. But these are written that you might believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. He's the son of God and that in believing you might have life through his name. So one of the duties and the responsibilities of a Melchizedek priest in the government of the heavenly father within his kingdom is you are to teach the people in the kingdom 
the ways of the Heavenly Father, which is his Torah. So everyone in his kingdom is to be taught the Torah and they're to live the Torah. And then if there's anyone that departs from the Heavenly Father's rules of the house, departs from the Torah, then a faithful Melchizedek priest, a faithful son, his job is then to, if the situation calls for it, to lay down his life to bring restoration and reconciliation of the family on behalf of the Heavenly Father. And so Yeshua testified to the Jews in John chapter 10, verses 11 and verse 14, that he is the good shepherd over the sheep of the nation of Israel or the house of Jacob. Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And then Yeshua states in John chapter 10, verse 15, as the father knows me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then Yeshua goes on to explain that there's no greater love than for one to lay down his life for the benefit of somebody else. So the highest way that you follow the Torah is love. Love is the highest form of following the Torah. And the highest form of love is to give up your life for the benefit of somebody else and to restore them and bring them back un- under the Father's rule and reign and authority. So that's why Yeshua said in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so when Yeshua died on the tree at his first coming, that one of the reasons for him doing this was he was redeeming the firstborn within the kingdom of his father who had departed from his father. And who is this firstborn people or firstborn nation that departed from the ways of the heavenly father? It was the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was led by the tribe of Ephraim, which is a part of Joseph. And Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, was given the blessing of the firstborn by Jacob in Genesis in chapter 48. But in the history of the nation of Israel, After the days of King David and Solomon, the kingdom got split in the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And the first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, was from the tribe of Ephraim. So the northern kingdom was a firstborn nation. And rather than faithfully being teachers of the Torah and if needed and possible to lay down your life, given that the firstborn was given the double portion, the double blessing, so they would have the means to bring back someone within the family who had departed from the family, that the firstborn nation themselves, they departed from the Torah and the ways of the God of Israel by... And the scriptures tells us that beginning with the first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, they set up a golden calf system of worship. And instead of going to Jerusalem and to worship the Lord at Jerusalem, as the Torah states, they set up alternative places of worship, one being 
in the north of Israel in Dan and the other in Bethel. And from this, the northern kingdom was judged and they were cut off from the covenant as outlined in Hosea in chapter one and was prophesied through the children that were born from the marriage between Gomer and Hosea. And the name of the first child was Jezreel, Hosea chapter 1, verse 4, which means God will sow or God will scatter. The northern kingdom was to be scattered into the nations of the world. And in doing so, they were going to be cut off from the covenant. And in being cut off from the covenant, they were not going to be shown mercy for their sin. And that's why the second child was named Lo Ruhama, no mercy. And they were to be regarded as not being the people of the God of Israel anymore. That's why the third child was named Lo Ami, which means not my people in Hosea chapter one and verse nine. But after receiving a judgment that then the God of Israel was going to show them mercy. And this mercy was going to come through the redemptive work of the Messiah, wherein it's prophesied in Hosea chapter 1 verse 10 that a people that are called not a people in their judgment, that they are going to be called sons of the living God through the redemptive work of the Messiah. And the redemptive work of the Messiah, in order to redeem the firstborn who had departed and also provide salvation for the entire world, he had to perform a primary duty of a Melchizedek priest, which is if someone from the family or someone of his father's kingdom departs from the family, he must be willing to lay down his life in order to bring forth that redemption. And this is what Yeshua is explaining to the Jews in John chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. So he says to the Pharisees, other sheep I have, not of this fold. So Yeshua in John chapter 10 is addressing a question that the Pharisees ask him at the end of John chapter 9, where they said to Yeshua, are we blind? So Yeshua is speaking to Pharisees who are Jews And he says, I have another sheepfold that's not you. So Yeshua called the Pharisees who he was speaking to a part of his sheepfold. But he says, I have another sheepfold that's not you. So what sheepfold was Yeshua addressing when he's speaking to the Pharisees? He's speaking to the southern kingdom of the house of Judah. Who's the other sheepfold then that he would have? It would be the northern kingdom of Ephraim or the ten tribes. And then he explains to the Pharisees that them also I must bring. That is the northern kingdom. Why must he bring them? Because in the constitution or the Torah of the heavenly father within his kingdom, the firstborn is to be redeemed. And so the firstborn of the family of the heavenly father, the northern kingdom, that they've departed from his Torah through the first king, Jeroboam, and the succeeding kings of the northern kingdom. Because it's said in mostly every succeeding king after Jeroboam of the northern kingdom that they followed after the sins of Jeroboam and they did not repent from his sins and so they were cut off and so this is why Yeshua tells the Pharisees them that is the northern kingdom I must bring I must redeem the firstborn and they will hear my voice in other words they will believe that I am the Messiah and ultimately in the fullness of the redemptive work of the Messiah that the family will be restored reconciled and unified again 
And Yeshua explains this to the Pharisees with the words, there will be one fold, in other words, the two sheepfolds, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, from the two sheepfolds that were separated after the days of David and Solomon, that there will be one fold, and when there's one fold, when they are united, restored, and reconciled with each other, there will be one shepherd over them. That one shepherd is Yeshua. He just stated to the Pharisees, In John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14, that he is the good shepherd. And then Yeshua explains, because he's going to redeem the firstborn, because there's going to be a redemption and reconciliation of the family of the heavenly father, that is the house of Jacob, the nation of Israel, that in order for there to be a reconciliation and reunification of the house of Jacob after they were split in the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, that Yeshua is going to have to lay down his life in order for there to ultimately be a united nation of Israel. So Yeshua says in John chapter 10, verse 17, Therefore... Because there's going to be one fold and one shepherd over united northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Therefore, does my father love me because I laid down my life. So, Yeshua is stating that one of the reasons why he is dying on the tree is to take two nations who were split and divided within the family of the heavenly father. And to make them one people and they were divided, they were exiled because they were unfaithful to the constitution of the kingdom of God, the Torah of the kingdom of God. And so therefore they sinned and the heavenly father desires that the sins of his people be forgiven, that they would repent And there would be restoration and reconciliation. And so this task is going to come about through one who was faithful in the government of the Heavenly Father, which is the Melchizedek priesthood. And the only one that proves himself faithful to the task is Yeshua the Messiah. That's why... In being faithful over the domain and the people of the Heavenly Father, that Yeshua, in his faithfulness, he's going to receive an inheritance of his Father, and he's going to be an heir of all things of his Father. He is going to forever rule and reign over his father's kingdom. In Hebrews, in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it is written, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So, the father speaks through his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Then in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4, being made so much better than the angels as he, that is Yeshua, by inheritance or being faithful in his Melchizedek priesthood role and task and duties, he has obtained a more excellent name than the angelic class in the heavenlies that are a part of the kingdom of the Heavenly Father. So let's summarize this part of the teaching. One who has the position of firstborn high priest and king, that is being a part of the Heavenly Father's government within the Melchizedek priesthood, and thus is in a position to rule and reign in the Father's kingdom, he must be 
if the situation calls for it, a redeemer of his father's people when they depart from the Torah. And he must be faithful in this task. And in being faithful to this task, he's going to be called a faithful son. One who has the position of firstborn high priest and king, that is the government position of the heavenly father or the Melchizedek priesthood, who is able to rule and reign in the kingdom of the heavenly father, must be faithful to be a redeemer. And that faithfulness, when the situation calls for it, will require you to lay down your life to redeem someone within the kingdom or the family that has departed from the ways of the family, which is the Torah. And then by being faithful in this Melchizedek priestly governmental role and be willing to lay down your life for others, that qualifies you through faithfulness to rule and reign in the kingdom of the heavenly father and to be a part of his government and to be an heir to rule and reign in the father's kingdom. And so in the book of Genesis, we have in Genesis in chapter five, we are given genealogical information from Adam to Noah. And oftentimes when people are reading their Bibles, they would want to skip over the genealogies because they might view the genealogies as not being so important or relevant to them as they're trying to read and understand the Bible. And so why is this genealogical information here for us in the book of Genesis, in Genesis in chapter 5? Because the God of Israel is explaining to us his governmental structure, his governmental order, and what happened among those who were in the position and his kingdom and his government to rule and reign with the heavenly father. And so we're told in John chapter 1 verse 3 and verse 10 that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Paul also explains this in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. So it was the will of the heavenly father for there to be an earth, but the one who created the earth with the words, let there be light, was Yeshua. And so the heavenly father put Yeshua in the position of being a steward, a Melchizedek priest, over his creation and over the earth. And then in creating the heavens and the earth, then there was a man that was created and put in the earth. And the man who was created and put in authority over the creation of the kingdom of God was Adam. And so Adam was under the authority of Yeshua, who's under the authority of the heavenly father. And so Adam is given a place of stewardship in the earth. And he was called to oversee and rule and reign and bring forth and to establish and to teach God's kingdom on the earth. And so Adam was given the place and the authority of being a Melchizedek priest. And so because Adam sinned in the garden, ultimately as a punishment for his disobedience, he was exiled out of the garden, but 
then he also died physically as well. And so then, who then is going to be the steward in his place on the earth in the kingdom of God on the earth? Well, it's going to be the oldest, faithful, firstborn from Adam who's going to take over that position. And so how do we understand how things went from Adam? That's the purpose of the genealogies. And when we look at the genealogies in Genesis in chapter 5, we see from Adam to Noah, there were 10 generations. And then... From Noah, one of his sons was Shem. Genesis chapter 5, verse 32. And then from Shem to Abraham, the line there is outlined for us in Genesis in chapter 11. And so from Noah to Abraham, there are also 10 generations. And after Abraham, he, he had Isaac and then Jacob. So, therefore, from Adam to Jacob, there are 22 generations. Interesting that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so, next, I have for you a chart of the genealogical line from Adam to Noah, and then from Noah to to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and this chart includes Joseph as well. And this chart is useful by looking at it because it's going to allow us to see and understand who then was the steward of the kingdom of God on earth after Adam. Who was the oldest faithful firstborn from Adam? And that would be Seth. And so Seth was the second steward overseer, Melchizedek priest in the earthly kingdom of God. When Seth died, who was the third? It was Enos. Who was the fourth? Canaan. And who is the fifth? Mahalalel. And who is the sixth? Jared. And who was the seventh? Methuselah. And who was the eighth? Noah. Who was the ninth? Shem. And who was the tenth? Eber. And who was the eleventh? Isaac. And then who was in position to be the twelfth? Well, Esau was in position to be the 12th overseer, steward of the kingdom of God on earth or be God's Melchizedek priest on the earth. But the Bible gives us a detailed account where Esau didn't value his place and his position and his authority, but his twin brother Jacob did. And so Esau, not being focused on spiritual things, he was concerned with material things more that Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. And so Jacob becomes the 12th Melchizedek priest on the earth from Adam. And the number 12 in the Bible is the number that represents the government of God. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 original disciples of Yeshua. And so then let's look in greater detail. What does it mean to be a Melchizedek priest? Well, Melchizedek 
consists of two Hebrew words, Melech, which means king, and Zedek, which means righteousness. And so this meant the office of being the king of righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 7, in verses 1 and 2, it is written, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is the old name for Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham. This is talking about Genesis in chapter 14. Returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, that is Melchizedek, Melech Zedek, king of righteousness, and he was also the king of Salem. And this is a play on the Hebrew. From Salem, we have the Hebrew word shalom, which means the peace. He's the king of peace. This is a reference back to Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. In Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So literally on the earth, who was this Melchizedek priest that Abraham gave tithes to in Genesis in chapter 14? Well, it was Shem. But Shem was Earth's representative of the kingdom of God on behalf of Yeshua, who's the father's steward over the earth. And so Shem was the earthly Melchizedek priest in the kingdom of God on earth. And he was the representative on earth for the overall kingdom of God and his place in his position once again in authority was underneath Yeshua on behalf of the heavenly father in Genesis in chapter 14 verses 19 and 20 we see that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek so in given the tithes to Melchizedek Abraham was really given his tithes to the God of Israel. But the agent on earth through which he was going to give tithes to the God of Israel is his Melchizedek priest on the earth, which in Genesis chapter 14, it was Shem. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, in the order from the creation of the world, beginning with Adam, as we saw in our list from the chart, that Noah was the eighth Melchizedek priest on the earth, being given the position and place of the supreme steward on earth over the kingdom of God. And this is what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 is referring to. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth. And the word person is in italics in the King James, which means it's not in the Greek text. Noah is the eighth, what? Preacher, preacher or teacher of righteousness. So Noah was to be a teacher of the ways of the God of Israel on earth, teaching the ways of his kingdom and What's the ways of his kingdom? His throne and his kingdom is based on justice and righteousness. And he's to teach the people the instruction of the kingdom. And Torah is the Hebrew word for instruction. And so Noah was a teacher of the Torah, the instruction of God to the people on the earth. And the earth was to be a place where the kingdom of God would operate in the kingdom of God would rule and reign. Yeshua is our ultimate teacher of righteousness in the kingdom of the heavenly father. 
Hosea chapter 6 verse 3 it is written, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. In Joel chapter 2 verse 23 it is written, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, And the King James says, he's given you the former rain moderately. But what this says in the Hebrew, where the King James translates as former rain moderately, former rain is the Hebrew word moreh, and moreh means a teacher. And moderately is the Hebrew word zedekah. And so, This says he's given you the Moreh Zedekah. He's given you the teacher of righteousness. And who is the teacher of righteousness? It's the Melchizedek priest of the kingdom of the God of Israel. And that Melchizedek priest is also the Messiah. So let's summarize this part of the teaching. Beginning with Adam, who was the world's first Melchizedek priest of the kingdom of God on the earth, the oldest firstborn living on the earth who was faithful had the leadership position in the government of God on earth, the Melchizedek priesthood, and he had priestly rights, and thus by having priestly rights, he received tithes, For the kingdom of God on behalf of the heavenly father for those on earth who wanted to give tithes to the God of Israel. Number two, by being faithful to the God of Israel, that means teaching the ways of his kingdom to the people on the earth. That means to follow his Torah, which means instruction. He had the title of being a teacher of the ways of the kingdom of God, being a teacher of justice and righteousness, being a teacher of righteousness, that the oldest firstborn living on the earth qualifies to become a redeemer in the kingdom of God for those in that kingdom who depart from the ways of the king of the kingdom and the ways of the king of the kingdom is his Torah. So, He has the place and the position to be a redeemer for anyone within the kingdom or all mankind who would depart from the Torah, the ways of the God of Israel, and were under the curse that was brought about through Adam's disobedience in the garden. Number three, the oldest firstborn living on the earth who had the leadership position of the government of God on the earth, the Melchizedek priesthood, must be willing, if the situation calls for it, to lay down his life and to serve others, to bring restoration and reconciliation to the kingdom of the God of Israel if there were subjects of the king who departed from his ways or departed from his Torah. And Noah was the eighth Melchizedek priest on the earth on behalf of the kingdom of God from Adam, who was the first Melchizedek priest. So let's examine how the rabbis teach from the Midrash Rabbah Numbers 4, 8, that Adam was the world's firstborn. Adam was the world's firstborn. When he offered his sacrifice, as it says, and it pleased the Lord better than a bullock that has horns and hoofs. Psalm chapter 69, verse 31. He donned high priestly garments, as it says. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. They were robes of honor, which subsequent firstborn used. Adam was given the birthright or the firstborn blessing or office from Midrash Rabbah, Genesis 97, 6. 
And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, Genesis chapter 48, verse 21. Moreover, I have given to you one portion, or in Hebrew, Shechem, above your brethren, Genesis chapter 48, verse 22. Rabbi Judah maintained the portion or Shechem means the birthright and the raiment of Adam. The firstborn also had priestly rights and duties from the Midrash Rabbah, Genesis 63, 13. And Jacob said, swear to me, Genesis chapter 25, verse 33. That is in speaking to Esau. Why did Jacob display such eagerness for the birthright? Because we learned that before there was the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the sacrificial service upon the altar was performed by the firstborn. After it was erected, that is the sin of the golden calf, the sacrificial service was performed by priests or Levitical priests. Adam was made king over the kingdom of the God of Israel on earth, as we can see from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as it is written. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So when Adam was given dominion, dominion means rule and reign. So Adam had the position of being a king in the kingdom of the God of Israel on earth. It says in Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. And so we can see from these things that Adam had the place and the position and the office of being a king, a priest, and a firstborn. And so one who is a king, a priest, and a firstborn is one who is a Melchizedek priest in the kingdom and the governmental order of the God of Israel on earth. So Adam, being a Melchizedek priest to be a steward over the kingdom of God on the earth for the God of Israel. He had a responsibility with this office to teach the ways of that kingdom to the people on the earth. That is to teach the Torah, the, the teaching, the instruction of the God of Israel's kingdom. To teach it and to live it and as a part of of that responsibility and duty that if anyone in the kingdom that belonged to the family in particular departed from the ways of the kingdom that you were to perform the act of redemption to restore and to reconcile and to bring that person back into the family and to bring restoration to the kingdom. And if the situation so requires it, you must be willing to lay down your life to perform that act of redemption, restoration, and reconciliation of the family of the God of Israel and his kingdom. And so now we look at the events that happened in the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it is written, And when the woman, that is Eve, saw that the tree was good for food, and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave it unto her husband with her, and he... And that is Adam did eat with her. Now we're told in the New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14 that in the garden Adam was not deceived. 
It was Eve that was deceived by the serpent. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, the woman was in the transgression. And so in the garden, it was Adam's responsibility given that his wife got deceived and had sinned and disobeyed the Torah or the commandment of the God of Israel. That is that in the garden of all the trees you may freely eat, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so Eve disobeyed that commandment. And so rather than Adam coming and instructing her regarding what she should have done and instead of Adam laying down his life for her to redeem and to restore her, he instead, he participated in the sin with her. So therefore he failed in his Melchizedek task, duty, and responsibility. And because he failed in his role and his task, then Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, as we're told in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man. The Hebrew word that's translated as drive out is the Strong's number 1644. And the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it's the Hebrew word garash. It means to drive out, expel. It means to divorce. So let's summarize what happened in the garden. Adam was created to be the world's king, priest, and firstborn over the kingdom of God on earth from which Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Adam was to be a steward of the kingdom of God on earth on behalf of Yeshua who created the heavens and the earth for his father. And so Adam had the place and the position of being a king, a priest, and a firstborn. And so, therefore, Adam is a Melchizedek priest in the government of God on earth within his kingdom. But Adam failed in his role and his task and responsibility as a Melchizedek priest because when his wife Eve sinned in the garden, in other words, violated the Torah, of the God of Israel, rather than instructing her, rather than laying down his life to redeem and reconcile and restore her, he participated in the sin with her. And so, because of Adam's disobedience and his place and his position as being the Melchizedek priest on the earth on behalf of God's kingdom, and to be a leader and a teacher and example for everyone living on the earth in this kingdom, he failed in his duty and his task, so he was kicked out of the garden. Now we're going to look at the next example in the Bible regarding the same issue, and we're going to look at the account of Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it is written, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And so Cain is a firstborn. And Cain had a brother named Abel in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 2. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so um, we see that they had different occupations in their lives. And so within the kingdom of God, you are to bring offerings to the God of Israel And a part of these offerings was to show thanksgiving 
and thanks and gratitude unto him for who he is and for his provision. And in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it is written, And Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now the Hebrew word that's translated here as offering is minha. And minha is a gift that is given to someone by your own free will and from your heart. And so these were gifts that were being brought and given to the God of Israel. But the reason why the God of Israel received Abel's offering is because he gave it with the right heart and the right attitude. And Cain did not bring his offering to the God of Israel with the right heart and attitude. We can see that this word minha that was brought by Cain and Abel the offering that it's translated as a gift or a present. We can see this in Genesis chapter 32, verse 18 and 20. And it's something that is freely given from the heart. Then you will say, they be your servant Jacob's. It is a minha. It is a present sent unto my Lord Esau. And so a minha here is a free will gift from the heart that Jacob is sending and given to his brother Esau. And now Genesis chapter 32, verse 20. And say ye moreover, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with a minha, with a gift from my heart that goes before me. Peradventure he will accept it of me. So when we give a gift from the heart to the God of Israel, we are to give our best in Genesis chapter 43, verse 11. And their father Israel said unto them, if it must be so now do this, take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down this man a minha, a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. No Minha, no free will gift from the heart, can be made from leaven. And leaven is going to represent something that is insincere, something that is impure. In Leviticus chapter 2 verse 11 it is written, No minha which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. Leaven also represents sin or an evil heart. We're told in Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, that the first fruit of the land belongs to the God of Israel. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. And so this is the background for us to understand why the God of Israel received Abel's offering and not Cain's offering. We see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, that Cain brought a minha from the fruit of the ground. Genesis chapter 4 verse 3. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground a minha unto the Lord. So a minha can be a first fruits offering. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 14. And if you offer a minha of your first fruits unto the Lord. And so you're to freely give from your heart, your first fruits unto the Lord in thankfulness to him for who he is in his provision. We're told that the firstborn of man and beast belongs to the God of Israel. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Now, Abel brought a first fruit offering. Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock 
and of the fat thereof. Now, this minha is to be brought to the priest. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And when any will offer a minha unto the Lord, he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. A minha is linked with holiness. Psalm chapter 96, verses 8 and 9. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Bring a minha and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. And so Abel's minha offering is accepted, but Cain's is rejected. Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect or he did not accept and receive. So with this background of understanding what was being given, the minha, the requirements of it, why was Abel's minha accepted and not Cain's? Because Abel gave a first fruit of his offerings and he did it with a joyful heart and he freely gave it from his heart. But Cain did not give from his heart and um, he gave grudgingly and he did not give his best. And so therefore the God of Israel, because Cain gave it grudgingly because he didn't give his best, because he didn't have the right attitude. This is why the God of Israel rejected Cain's offering. And so this is what Paul wrote and taught to us regarding what our attitude should be in giving in 2 Corinthians In chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, it reads, But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor and his righteousness remains forever. So the attitude of our heart in our giving is we are not to give unto the Lord grudgingly or of necessity because God is not going to receive one who gives with a heart that gives with an attitude of grudgingly or of necessity. So this is why Cain's offering was rejected. Now, Cain was older than his brother Abel. So Cain is the, has the place and the position of being a firstborn. And being a firstborn, he had firstborn responsibilities and rights. And being a firstborn, he was to receive the double portion. And by receiving the double portion, he was to have the means by which, if the situation arose and called for it, that if someone within the family departed from the family, he would have the means to go out and to redeem or restore the one that departed from the family back to the family. And it was the firstborn's responsibility to teach the Torah, to be an example to the rest of the family. It was also the firstborn's responsibility, if the situation called for it, to lay down his life. That being the case, let's look at the conversation that the God of Israel has with Cain, as found in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, the God of Israel did not respect. 
And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And so what is translated as very wroth is the Hebrew word hara. It means to be hot. It means to, to be furious. It means to burn with anger. And so when the God of Israel did not receive Cain's offering, Cain got mad at the God of Israel. See, it's Cain that brought his offering grudgingly or of necessity. He did not give it freely. He did not give his best. He did not have the right heart attitude. But yet when his offering was not received, he got mad even though he was the one that was doing what he was doing with the wrong heart and with the wrong attitude. And so in Genesis chapter 4 verse 6, the Lord says to Cain, why are you so angry? Why are you wroth? And then the God of Israel instructs him in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. If you do well, in other words, you already are older than your brother. You're the firstborn in your family. If you do what your responsibilities are, and if you're faithful to it, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, then sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. So don't you know that if you do well, that you will rule over your brother? And then in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain kills his brother Abel. So being a firstborn of the family, it was Cain's responsibility to be the overseer and the example and the teacher of the ways of the God of Israel in the family. And being the firstborn and ultimately having the place to have and receive the double portion blessing, he was to be a helper of anybody in the family that needed that help. He must even be willing to lay down his life if the situation calls for it. So he's already in the position and the place and the authority over his brother. And in the kingdom of God, he, is a, he has a responsibility for his brother. And that being the case, let's see and understand the conversation that takes place in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, when the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So why did Cain say, am I my brother's keeper? Because he is his brother's keeper, being the firstborn in the family. He's just failing in that task and that's response in, his, in that responsibility. And he's giving an angry reply from his heart. Once again, his heart attitude is wrong. So let's summarize what we've covered here regarding Cain and Abel and how this allows us to understand the responsibility of a Melchizedek priest in the kingdom of the God of Israel. And a Melchizedek priest is a king, a priest, and a firstborn. So as a firstborn, Cain is a firstborn in the family and Abel is his younger brother. Both Cain and Abel brought a minha offering to the God of Israel. And a minha offering is an offering that must be given freely from the heart and you must give your best and it is is to be a first fruit offering under the God of Israel. Cain's minha offering was rejected because it was given with a wrong heart and a wrong attitude. He didn't give his best. And Abel's minha offering was accepted. Because Cain's minha offering was rejected, 
we can assume the reason for it is he did not fulfill the requirements by the God of Israel for that minha offering. And so therefore, we can assume that he did not bring his best offering with the proper heart attitude. But instead of repenting for his behavior by not bringing his best, by not having the proper heart attitude regarding the matter, Cain became angry at the God of Israel for rejecting his minha offering. And being a firstborn, Cain was responsible for being a spiritual example to his brother. And if the situation called for it, be willing to lay down his life for his benefit. But rather than laying down his life for the benefit of his brother, Cain rejected his firstborn responsibility to his brother and killed him instead. So therefore, we see that Adam failed in his responsibility in the government of God in the garden and Cain is failing in his responsibility within the kingdom of God as a firstborn as well. And so this is going to conclude part one on this teaching of the Melchizedek priesthood where we are explaining to you the kingdom of God, the government of God, and a particular part of the government of God, which is the Melchizedek priesthood. What it is, it means that if you're a Melchizedek priest, you have the office of king, priest, firstborn. And there's duties and obligations and responsibilities within the kingdom of God when you have that office. When you're faithful to the office, then you will be able to rule and reign in the kingdom of God. And you will receive an inheritance from the Heavenly Father, for your faithfulness. But if you're unfaithful in the office, then you're going to lose your place in the kingdom of God. You're going to lose your place to rule and reign in the government of God. So we will continue this teaching and look at more biblical examples in part two of the teaching. Oh, I love.